Elon Musk informs us what went wrong with Starship SN10's landing and the kinds of fixes they're making for SN11. Starbase is already coming a real place on paper. Another Starlink mission lifts off and new features are coming to the service. I'm Kevin and this is SpaceX in the News. Elon has once again provided us with a debrief of Starship's flight performance. If you recall, the mission to 10 clicks and back was a great success, with Starship landing itself on the pad down there in South Texas. However, just a dozen minutes later, the test vehicle rapidly disassembled itself. Elon tweeted on March 5th that for reasons unknown at the time, the rough landing was caused by low thrust, despite being given a higher thrust limit. They've never seen this before, so next time they'll go with a minimum of two engines all the way to the pad and restart engine three if one or two have issues. Then, just four days later, after his team had a chance to comb through the data, he elaborated further that the single Raptor engine responsible for landing SN10 had low thrust, probably because some helium from the methane header tank got into the engine. Starship impacted at 10 meters a second, crushing its legs and part of the skirt that houses the engine compartment multiple fixes in work for SN11. So in other words, prior to landing, Starship switches from drawing fuel from its main tanks to smaller and more pressurized header tanks, allowing the engines to more efficiently consume propellant when the landing flip maneuver is underway and the liquid oxygen and methane are sloshing around inside tanks. This sloshing can lead to pockets or bubbles getting into the engines. There are ways to help mitigate this issue in rocketry. Baffles, for instance, are like skin tags protruding from the inner tank walls that help tame the sloshiness and pressurizing the tanks is another way, filling extra space up with gas so that all the liquid propellant wants to do is quickly leave the tank through the path of least resistance, which when the fuel valve is open, leads straight to the engines. The smaller the tank, the more easily it can be pressurized, which is why the header tanks exist. After SN8 ate pavement during its test flight, due to lack of pressurization in its methane header tank, Elon approved switching the pressurizing gas from an autogenous one of methane to helium. SN9 didn't get far enough along in its landing sequence to really see how this switch paid off, but SN10 did, and Elon thinks it was the helium, possibly aided by a baffle that acted like a straw, sucking bubbles in from above the liquid gas level, that caused the hard landing. Quote, my fault for approving, sounded good at the time. See, this is what rocket science is all about, or rocket engineering as Elon calls it. Sure, on the surface, these flying sex toys may look like dumb boomsticks, but man can they be complicated. And we haven't even spoken about Starship's leg designs yet, a problem Elon and his team of engineers have struggled to solve now for months. And it's to the point that they might just forgo legs entirely and catch the ship with the launch tower, just like they now plan to do with its super heavy booster. He's even back to considering landing Starship in a big net or bouncy castle, a strategy he teased years ago to recover the second stage of his Falcon 9 rockets. Does that mean Mars will have bouncy castles? Because if so, you can sign me up on that first mission, brah. Oh, and just for bonus conversation, Elon thinks Alon, or transparent aluminum, would be a cool substitute for Starship's windows. But anyway, as the boss was saying, the fix is in, literally, for Starship 11. Austin Bernard captured some images of the rocket's physical therapist doing range of motion exercises with the legs, hopefully so they deploy properly this time. And less than a week after SN10 lost its will to live, 11 made its way down Highway 4 to the meat grinder, or launch pad, on Monday, complete with its three Raptor engines. The following night, it underwent its first of a series of stress tests, the ambient pressure test to check for leaks. Wednesday's cryo was halted for unknown reasons, but was completed the following evening, along with some reaction control system checkouts. SN11 static fire is expected to happen as early as today, so keep an eye on Lab Padre's live stream if you just can't seem to heat things up enough in your life. SpaceX employees working at the Texas Starship site, apparently already going through withdrawals, just couldn't wait any longer to see more rockets fly, so they launched a whole fleet of them to celebrate a year of great work. And in typical Boca Chica fashion, each one exploded. It doesn't look like we'll be calling Boca Chica, Boca Chica for long. Elon is already calling the place Starbase. We first discussed this in last week's episode, but things are already getting super serial. I am super duper serial. SpaceX has filed a trademark for the city with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in D.C. with the intent to cover the categories of launch services, namely launching the payload of others into space. And the company is working with the U.S. Army of Civil Engineers to extend its Starbase footprint. Salsa Chips on Reddit, mmm, chips, was kind enough to Photoshop these plans onto RGV's aerial photo of SpaceX's launch site for easier comparison. Now let's move on and debrief this week's Starlink mission. 
In the un-American hours of 3 in the morning on Thursday, SpaceX launched their 21st flock of Starlink satellites into orbit. The booster successfully made its sixth landing on the drone ship just read the instructions out on the Atlantic. This is the second Falcon 9 launch of the month, and if the 2021 manifest is met, SpaceX will do about 75% of total Earth payload to orbit with the vehicle. A single Starship, however, is designed to do in a day what all rockets on Earth currently do in a year. Yet even so, it will require 1,000 Starships and 20 years to build a self-sustaining city on Mars. The next Falcon 9 launch is another Starlink launch, scheduled for March 14th at a disgusting 5.44 a.m. Eastern Time. SpaceX has applied with the SCC to extend Starlink service to moving vehicles, not Teslas, something they have previously experimented with using U.S. military planes. Because the terminal will be larger than the one customers use for their homes, this service is reserved for much beefier modes of transportation, like aircraft, ships, large trucks, and RVs. Now that's camping. If you remember a few weeks back, Elon tweeted that SpaceX would be trying out some new upgrades to Starlink, so users may see speeds double to 300 megabits per second. Well, beta testers are already seeing those results on their network. However, at the moment, it comes at the price of stability, with more dropouts and coverage reported as well. Obviously, as more sats reach their intended parking orbit, dropouts will become less frequent. And finally, for future launches, USS F-36 and Enroll-69, SpaceX has been awarded two individual firm fixed price task orders from the U.S. Air Force, totaling $160 million under the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 contract. These missions are expected to lift off by the end of 2023. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you to all my members and patrons for their support of these videos. Do have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed.